Well, good mo good evening, everyone. It's Wednesday evening, and a uh, little Bible study time. Share the Word of God with you a little bit. And hope everybody had a great day today. I hope that uh, hump day, middle of the week, was great for you. And I hope that as you spent your time today that you enjoyed the weather here in the Ozarks. It was a beautiful day, not real warm, but not cold. And uh, I kind of wore a little vest all day today. And uh, that's kind of how I am, a little bit cold natured, I guess you'd say. But it was a great day. And I hope that you had a great day today. I'm just kind of wait a little minute here. If you kind of let me know that you're here. And uh, if you want to get your Bible or open your smart device, we're going to be looking at Psalm 63 tonight. We've been doing a little series on praying through the Psalms. And um, you'll enjoy this tonight. You might relate to it some as we, as we walk through it. But it's going to be in Psalm 63 and... And uh, I'll try not to make it real long, but I want to kind of encourage you this evening and help you to be able to pray when you're in a difficult season, a difficult time, and give you some some signposts, so to speak, so to say that um, that you'll be able to look for when you're trying to decide where am I at in this journey and what can I do, how can I pray, how can I look at at uh, the situation. And I want you to know you're not the only one that has had to deal with difficulties in life. You're not the only one that's had to deal with problems and trouble. You are normal when you have something show up in your life that you didn't want. And some things that show up in our life are things that, that we caused. I, I, hate to, I hate to say it, but, but um, not everything. Not everything that happens in your life that's bad is, is because of something that you did. Some things are just life, uh, just like everything that happens in your life um, is, is, you know, not because of somebody before you or whatever, but it is a time and a season in your life. And some things, though, are simply a result of something that you did maybe immediately before or sometimes a result of something that happened that you did a long time back. Um, a lot of times I have people say to me, well, man, I... I I quit serving God and, and nothing got worse. Matter of fact, some things seemed to get better and um, vice versa. I started serving God and it seems like I still got trouble in my life. I don't know what happened. Can I tell you, that's, that's kind of a result of, of sowing and reaping. It's, it's a principle of the Word of God. And there are some principles in the Word of God you can't run, outrun. And um, they're just there. They're just part of life. And some principles that, um, that, that we deal with um, you sowed something somewhere back up the road and you're receiving something good for it or you're receiving something that you don't like for it. Um, my mom, who I've seen is watching tonight, my mom used to always say, um, you know, you, everything that you sow, uh, you don't always see the immediate harvest of it, but sometimes you can pray and ask God to give you a crop failure. Spray some Roundup on that stuff or something, you know, get get rid of it. But Tonight, we're going to talk about Psalm 63, and we're going to find that David is in a position and a situation in his life that is a result of something that, that he had done wrong, and, and we hate that. We consider David a hero, but David was real. He was just like us. He had ups and downs and failures and discouragements and all those kind of stuff, but uh, before I get started, I'd I, I ran across this little thing I want to show you or tell you some little funny signs on trucks and that kind of stuff, cars, businesses. And uh, if you'll give me a chance to read these to you, it's, it says, um, on a plumbing company's van, said, a flush beats a full house. I thought that was, that was pretty funny. Another one that was on the list was, at a tire shop in Milwaukee, invite us to your next blowout. A towing company says, we don't charge an arm and a leg, we just want toes. Uh, maternity room door said, push, push, push. An optometrist office, if you don't see what you're looking for, you have come to the right place. A podiatrist office says, time wounds all heals. Any of y'all that's older knows that's true right there. <laughs> in a restaurant window, it said, don't stand there and be hungry. Come in and get fed up. 
And on a church sign, it said, you're not too bad to come in and you're not too good to stay out. I thought all those were cute and, and kind of brought some humor to my day and hopefully they bring a little humor to your day today. But if you're joined with me and you're ready right now, we're going to dive into this Psalms uh, 63. And uh, I got to give you a little background on it. We talked about this the other day that, that David, he spent two seasons of his life in the wilderness. He spent one season running from Saul. And he spent several years doing that. It wasn't just a short-term event, but it was really that David spent a long time running from Saul. And that had to be miserable. Saul wasn't just the king and he wasn't just a leader, but Saul was David's father-in-law. He was a relationship to him. You ever had family in your life that that something didn't go right? Maybe you had a little rubbing of ways or whatever. Maybe it was a, a child or a a parent or an in-law or a niece or nephew, an aunt, uncle, something. And 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 it's the way became bitter and difficult. This is what David was in. David wasn't just running from somebody who was after his life, but this was a family member to him. David had married Saul's daughter after killing Goliath. And so uh, this is where we find the second time that David was in the wilderness, and it was because he was running from Absalom. We find this in, the, in 2 Samuel chapter 15, and David's son Absalom had obtained a chariot and some horses and 50 men. For four years, uh, Solomon, I mean uh, Absalom, he had got up early and he had met the people at the city gate to resolve their legal claims. And when people would bow down to him, he would hold them and embrace them. He had a unique ability of being able to connect with people. I can see him. He was probably a, what we'd call today. He was a salesman. He was a he was smooth talker. He he knew how to connect and do all those things. And and as a as a result, verse six tells us that Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. He would say things like, "You know, this is what we should do. And if I was in power, this is what I would do." And, and people love that, and, and they begin to look towards him and look at the things that he uh, was saying. And, and Absalom then set up a rival throne in Hebron, and he declared himself to be king. And instead of choosing to fight, David decided, rather than fighting his own son, that he would flee and he would go into the wilderness. Verse 30 that reveals that David left Jerusalem and he was weeping and his head was covered in shame. There, there's a, a, a record that there was a man there that was throwing rocks at him. He, David was embarrassed. This was his son that was taken over. This was his son that was, that was taking the high end here. And, and so David is, is on the run and he's trying to figure out what to do. And the result, the reason why, was that, that David had had this affair with Bathsheba. And in having this affair, he got her pregnant, and then he decided to kill off her husband, Uriah, who was one of his strong men's, um, uh, I'm sorry, Bathsheba was one of David's strong men's granddaughters. And um, so this was a like an inner circle deal, and David's embarrassed, and he's trying to figure out how to cover it up. And when he does, God judges him. And God says, because of this, the sword will not leave your house. And so David is on the run from his own son, Absalom, and he's trying to figure out what to do. And, and he was probably wondering, you know, this is my son, and this wasn't supposed to happen this way, and, and it don't make any sense. And he was probably lonely and sad and brokenhearted and afraid, maybe even for his own life, that his son was going to destroy him to make sure he kept the kingdom. But today, you might be experiencing something just as difficult in your life. Oh, it might not be your son taking over your kingdom or a family member causing uh, something like that, like that, but you could be dealing with a situation in your life. Maybe a boss that, that has got your world turned upside down and you're on the run, you're trying to, to keep your job and trying to keep them satisfied, or, <clears throat> or maybe it's something else that's causing some kind of, some kind of issue. But you could be faced with something that you're trying to make sense of and you don't know what to do, just like David was. Maybe you've been rocked by some bad news. Maybe you got a bad doctor's report that came to you and you wasn't expecting it. Or maybe there was some divorce papers that showed up in your 
in your at your door and someone knocked on your door and said, you know, I'm here to summons you and give you some divorce papers and you weren't expecting it or you was hoping and praying that it wouldn't happen that way. That's how David felt. He said, you know, God had given him a judgment. He knew what was coming, but he didn't know what form it was going to show up in. And when it happened, he hated it. Maybe somebody's pulled the rug out from underneath you, somebody that you counted on, that you depended upon. But I feel like David was in a wilderness and maybe some of us are in a wilderness, but I've got some good news for you. It's not always bad to be in a wilderness. Wilderness wanderings create a thirst inside of us for God because when he's all we've got, he becomes all that you need. He becomes all that you desire. And sometimes God has to allow something to happen in our life that will strip off the things that we don't need in our world. And it's uncomfortable and it's painful and we hate it. And, 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 and we think, this shouldn't happen to me. But sometimes in that, God is revealing that he is really there for all the things that we need. And David lost everything. And now he's able to find the only thing that brings satisfaction to his life. And that is God himself. We could say it this way. Before David was forced into the wilderness, he was obsessed with all the things that King's life brought. Having his desires met, having satisfi satisfying everything, everything of the flesh that he wanted to have. That's what got him in trouble. He was supposed to be all fighting in the war that King's fought in. And instead he was at home on his house watching over the rooftop, looking at Bathsheba and her, her taking a bath. David had become obsessed with things that should not have been obsessing him. But I got a question for you tonight. What's obsessing you? What is it in your life that is obsessing you? Maybe it's a relationship. What is it that's causing you to not do things that you know you should do? Or is causing you to do things that you shouldn't do? What uh, an obsession is something that's abnormal. It's a, an intense preoccupation. It's an irrational reverence or attachment. I remember years ago when I was uh, working in a car dealership, there was an employee there and she was a wonderful lady, but she obsessed over her child. And it didn't matter what you said, you could bring an example in, you could be talking about something else and she would turn the conversation to that child who was about six years old, seven years old. And she obsessed over that child nonstop to the point that you couldn't hardly deal with her. And today, I just wonder, what is the thing that you're obsessing over? Maybe, is it a position that you're in? Maybe a hobby that you have? Uh, a sport that you enjoy? Maybe it's money. We all need money. It takes money to make the world go around. It takes money to pay the bills. It doesn't matter if it's at your house, my house, the house of God. It, it, that's part of life. But you can obsess over some things to the point that it will destroy your life, that you will sell your soul for it. Years ago, a friend of mine made this comment to me, and I've said it several times, and I remind myself over this. He said he, said he wanted to be a millionaire, and he said, I'll, sa <coughs> excuse me, I'll sacrifice everything. Wife, children, don't matter. I'll sacrifice everything to be a millionaire. Well, it didn't work out for him. And it's not going to work out for you neither. Anything that you place ahead of God is automatically set up for failure in your life. Some people, it's a relationship, a girlfriend, a boyfriend, a spouse. It's somebody that you want to be close to and maybe you're, you're putting off the things God wants you to do while you are waiting to make that relationship happen. Maybe you're obsessed about a possession, a, a, a retirement home or, a, or a, a retirement house, I should say, or a boat or an RV or a, a something that you're trying to get yourself towards. But you become preoccupied with that item and that thing, and you have an irrational reverence or an attachment to it, but you should really have a reverence and attachment to God over everything else. In Psalm 63, David refers to God 21 times in 11 verses. Almost two times a verse, he refers to God. He's obsessed with the omnipotent, almighty 
God. I believe that most of us really want to find full satisfaction in our relationship with God. Most of us are more empty, though, than we care to admit. We can come to church and we can clap our hands and we know how to smile. We know exactly when to raise our hands. We know exactly when to sit down. We know the words to say. It's almost become catechism to us. I hate to say, use that word, but it's really reality. And what God's looking for is something that pours out of the heart because you are obsessed with God and you're so crazily in love with God. This is what David found in the wilderness. He found all the stuff that he had ran to in the, in the palace and all the things that had become to preoccupy him. When he got back to the wilderness, he realized, this is what I've been missing. I've been missing my relationship with God. I've let too many other things get in my way. Usually most of us will look a lot of different places before we'll look to find out where we're missing things at with God. When we get that hunger down inside of us for God, we don't know how to identify it. A lot of, a lot of people today, today don't even know how to identify it. But, but what they'll do is they'll go buy something or they'll go eat something or they'll go find a place to go to, a vacation spot or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with those things. You, you got to eat and going on vacation is wonderful. But too often times, this is what happens to us. We try to satisfy the spiritual hunger in our soul with things that are of this world that are fleshly. And then when we get done, we're just as hungry. We're just as thirsty. We're craving something and we don't know what it is. And what I'm saying tonight is your obsession should be with God. Your obsession should be to get in his presence, to get in the place where you are finding him. Don't wait till God strips everything off of you to find that. Make it your first priority. There's a song that we used to sing years ago, and, and I'm not going to sing for you, but, but uh, it said, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full into his wonderful face, and the things of this world will go st grow strangely dim in the light of his glorious love or his glorious face. There's three signposts I want to show you that is in the wilderness that David points to. The first thing he's decided is, Am I longing for God? He had to take a inward look at himself and decide, what is it that I'm really longing for? Verse one says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Notice that David uses the personal pronoun to describe a relationship with God, an attachment with God. He says, my God. My God, there's something about when you identify God as being your God. This is my God. This is my Father. I think about when the Lord was teaching his disciples to pray, and he said, Our Father, our Father. See how it becomes personal. Our Father, which art in heaven. It, it's, you got to make that personal connection with God. David is seeking God early, or another translation says it this way. He is seeking God earnestly. And the idea of seeking God should be one of the first things that we do. Proverbs 8 and 17 says, I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. One way we can tell if we're really longing for God is if we're turning our thoughts towards him as soon as we wake up in the morning. What's the first thing you think about when you get up in the morning? Some of you might be, hmm, I got to get me a cup of coffee. I can relate to that. Some of you might be thinking, you know, I, I've got a list of things I got to do today. Or let me check the weather. But really, probably the first thing that you ought to be thinking about when you wake up in the morning is something to do with God. How much you love God. Being thankful for him giving you life and breath. Being thankful for the food that he's given you or shelter over your body or, or whatever it is. But it's that first thought. It's that first thing. Psalms 5 and 3 says, In the morning, O Lord, you hear my voice. In the morning, I lay my request before you, and I wait in expectation. Are we looking to God as soon as we run into a problem? You know, a lot of times people, they run into problems in their life, and God is the last resource that they find, that they look for. They'll go to every other resource. They'll look for every other thing. 
And really, I think the best thing that you can do is to look for God first. Look to God first. Get him early. Get him, go after him right at the beginning of, the, of, of your day, at the beginning of your problem. As soon as you get that bad doctor's report, the first thing you ought to be thinking is, God, where are we going with this? God, how are we going to handle this? God, I'm looking for you to help me through this. This is a difficult hour. When you get that pink slip on your job that lays you off, maybe the first thing you ought to think about is, God, what is the place that we're going to? What's the thing that we're trying to do that go, takes us from this point on to the next point? Start seeking God early. Start seeking God quickly. Don't wait until all your faith is gone because you've exhausted it trying to search out for other things. David's in a desert place with no water, and yet he longs for God more than he longs for a drink. David was dry and weary in his spirit. He's focused inward, and he could tell that something was missing. In verse 2, he says, I've seen you in the sanctuary, behold, and beheld your power and glory. David lets his mind begin to think about God's house and worshiping God and how good it felt inside there, how wonderful it was to get in the presence of God. I, we think about the house of God as, as being a building, and that's wonderful. As a matter of fact, I'm at the church at the moment. But we think about that as being the only place that we can experience God. But can I tell you this, this evening that you can experience God in your house, in your car, in your bedroom, while you're taking a shower, while you're trying to do your laundry, while you're sweeping the floor, while you're cutting the grass. You can begin to talk to God and just worship him. Say, oh God, I need you. I love you and begin to let your heart rise up to where God's operating at. I love worshiping God with people. And David, he talks about worshiping God with, with people. His mind begins to think about, oh, I remember being with your people. But the second thing is that I see the second signpost is we got to focus upward. Am I living for God? Verse 3 says, because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. What are you talking about? What are you speaking? Are you glorifying God with your words? Are you glorifying God with your conversation? Are you exalting him? Are you making him the peak? The scripture said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men into me. When you glorify God in your most difficult hour, I'm telling you that God will begin to minister to you and he'll begin to reach for those around you. God's loving kindness is superior to everything else. David never got over the fact that God loved him with a covenant-keeping commitment. As a result, he valued the favor and the friendship of God above everything else. Can I tell you that even while you're sleeping, while you're resting, God is dancing over you. God is desiring to be in connection with you. God loves you. He's not off on some distant journey. He's not off in some distant place. God is looking at you and he's saying, you are the apple of my eye. Whatever life has chosen, whatever life you've chosen, whatever you've given yourself to, whatever your obsession is right now, can I, can I tell you that God's love is so much better? Whatever you're obsessing over, I'm gonna tell you in the end, God's love is so, so much better. It's going to exceed anything that you can think about. It's going to exceed everything that you have ever desired because all those things are temporal or temporary and they pass away. That new car that you've obsessed over and you've worked double overtime and, and you've, you've tried everything to do to it, can I tell you what's going to happen to that thing in about 10 or 15 years? It's going to be crushed in a junk pile. It's going to be worthless. You're going to sell it off. It's going to be gone. Those things that you've obsessed over that's temporary, they're going to be gone before you know it. But I'm going to tell you, when you invest your life in the eternal things of God, they will last you. They will be a stronghold for you. They will be a protection over you. They will be the thing that empower you when you're in your weakest point. That's why David, he understood how much God loved him and had this commitment that God had towards him. And so he had a commitment towards God. And he said, it's much better than anything else. Jesus said it this way in John 10, 10. I love to quote this scripture. It says, I have come that they may have life 
and have it more abundantly. That's what King James says. Other translations says, have it more or have it to the fullest. You know, life is more than just eating and drinking. That verse 3 says that he glorified God with his lips. He responded to God in praise and he gave testimony of God's love towards others. David had a personal relationship with God. Tonight, I wonder, is your relationship with God a religious experience? Is it something that you just do on Sunday or midweek or Easter or Christmas? Or is your relationship with God personal? You communicating with him and him communicating with you. You sharing life together. You giving him your worst pain and him taking it and him giving you his best love, his best comfort, his best peace. Verse 5 says, my soul will be satisfied as the richest of foods. Can you imagine David? He was a king. I bet there wasn't any food that hadn't crossed his table that he could imagine. The finest of all foods, the best of all foods, the best cooked, the best prepared, the best seasoned. He probably had a Cajun on his chef, as one of his chefs. At least I would have. And, and, and so, you know, he probably had the very best. And he thought about it. He said, you know... The best foods in the world are not as good as the favor of God, as the satisfaction of being with God. In the Bible, we see oftentimes that God refers or, or compares his relationship with us to food, or we have this kind of in, in thing entwined in this. When, when Jesus had the last supper, the Passover meal was the last meal that he had before going to the cross. He did it with his disciples. He said, when we get to heaven, we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Ain't no wonder we like to eat so much after church. Ain't no wonder, wonder we like to get together and have some good food. It comes to us naturally from the Word of God and from our relationship with God. <clears throat> but I wonder how often, and I'm trying to wrap this thing down quickly, but I wonder how often that our spiritual life is filled with junk food. Just things to satisfy for the moment. Just a little high to, to get us going but I wonder if we got down and dug down into the riches of God's word and begin to apply those things in our life, suddenly the word of God would begin to mean so much more to us. We could drink deeply from the word of God. We could eat the word of God. I'm not talking about physically chewing the pages. I, my, my, my family had a dog that did that one time. I don't know how it worked out for him but or her, but, but uh, I'm talking about getting in the scripture and, and seeing what God is saying for your situation, for your hour. I'm, I'm going to try to hurry here, but, but David said that he was singing with his lips, with his mouth. He said, I'm going to praise God. He decided, I'm going to praise in the middle of my trouble, in the middle of the conflict I'm having with my child, in the middle of being on a run because he has gathered people against me. I'm going to worship God. I'm going to exalt God. I'm going to lift him up. And, you know, there came a time that they, that Absalom went to war. Matter of fact, it wasn't but a few days. And Absalom went to war, and Absalom lost his life. But David didn't know that up front. David just decided, I'm going to worship God. I'm going to praise God. I'm going to exalt God. Because I know who God is, and I know that God can take care of me, and I know that he is faithful. You know, sometimes... <clears throat> We can spend a lot of our time laying on our bed worrying about things. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I don't even know what's going to happen tonight. Who would have ever thought that some little small micro germ would leave China and go around the globe and cause trillions of dollars worth of damage in people's lives? Who would have thought that? I guarantee you in December and January we weren't Early January, we weren't thinking about that. You can lay in your bed and worry about all kinds of stuff. But instead, why don't you worship God? When worry seems to creep in, when worry seems to roll in on top of you, why don't you just begin to worship God and love him? Because God will fight your battle for you. The battle's not yours anyway. <laughs> I love this song that that we that sang, uh, Yolanda Adams sings it. He says, the battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. If we can ever get that concept down, you'll be able to understand that, that you don't have to fight. God's not looking for you to fight. 
The, the, the scripture doesn't say be strong for the Lord. I, you know, people, a lot of people think that I got to be strong for God. No, the scripture says be strong in the Lord. Be strong in a lot, a lot of difference between being in strong for the Lord and being strong in the Lord. You just worship God and exalt him and see what God will begin to do. I, I, I got to hurry, but we get down to, to the third signpost, the final signpost. It says, am I looking for God? I got to focus forward. After longing for God and, and trying to make sure everything's okay, David began to look forward. He began to see, they who seek my life, verse 9 and 10 says, they who seek my life will be destroyed. They will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be given over to the sword and become food for the jackals. David began to look forward to what's going to happen after here. What's going to happen after today? What can I expect God to do? That's what we call faith. You know, it's, it's that picture you have in your mind. I got, I've got this thing, matter of fact, I read it this morning. I prayed when I was praying this morning. I was thinking about it. On my mirror at the beginning of January, I wrote 2020, our decade of destiny. I thought when I read that this morning, which I try to read it every day, but I don't always. When I read it this morning, I thought, who would have ever thought all the stuff in our lives that we would be dealing with this part of, uh, this part of 2020? And yet this is what I found. It's still my decade of destiny because by faith, I'm looking beyond today. I'm looking beyond this season. I'm looking beyond this time. I am looking to see what God is going to bring out of all of this that is going to bring revival in my own life first and bring revival in this church and bring revival in this region and bring revival in this nation and in this world. I promise you that if you will begin to focus forward, instead of worrying about the past and worrying about where you are and begin to speak things into existence like I talked about in devotion this morning, if you'll begin to speak those things into existence, that suddenly your focus forward will take you off the trouble of today and see how great God is and what he is going to do. Uh, it says that, that David began to see that God was going to intervene in his situation. He didn't have no idea how. Quit trying to plan how God's going to intervene in your situation. Quit trying to figure it out and pencil and paper it down. And all that does is cause frustration and confusion in your life. Instead, decide, I am going to pray for God to be glorified and I'm going to look for him to do something great. You might decide to put something up on the mirror. I'm going to win a 10 souls to God this year. I'm going to win five souls to God. If you just won one soul to God this year, if every one of us just won one this year, we would double what our influence in the kingdom. And maybe more than that, you don't know what that soul that you're going to win, who they're going to touch and who they're going to change and who they're going to reach for. I want to encourage you tonight to look forward to the future, to look forward to what God is going to do. Because when God is all that you have, you'll realize that God is all that you need. You don't have to depend on something else. You don't have to worry about somebody else. He's going to take care of it. What are you obsessing about tonight? Whatever it is, put it in God's hands. Leave it alone. Worship God. Do the best you can and keep walking. Don't be driven by something. Instead, walk hand in hand with God and he'll take care of all your needs and he'll give you all the resources that you're ever going to need. Let me pray for you before we finish. Father, I thank you right now because you are the God of our salvation. And Lord, I believe that you are the one that we can put our confidence in in our worst, most difficult time. Even if we caused it to happen like David did here, that he was receiving some judgment from God for his mistake. God, I pray right now that you would be merciful to us. As, that you would give us a crop failure for problems that we caused on our own self and that you would help us in things that life just brought our way. God, I pray that you would minister to your people, that you would encourage them in their wilderness spot and that they would understand that if they will focus on you and they will focus on what you're going to do in the future, that we can lay aside the weight and the worry of today. God, I pray that you would gather them close to you you said, how often would I have gathered you as a hen 
gathereth her chicks. God, in my mind, I just see you wanting to gather your people and protect them and love them and care for them. And God, too often times we're trying to solve issues on our own that only you can solve, only you can take care of. God, I love you tonight. We love you. I am looking for the revival that you're going to do in this church. I am looking for revival in this nation. I'm not talking about just an ingathering of souls. I'm talking about a transformation in the highest places in this nation. That God releases, there's something right, that God releases the power of the Holy Ghost to shake this nation and that he puts the right people in the right places that sets us apart from this world that would seek to gather us into a place that we don't need to be at. God, I thank you because I can trust you to do this and I believe it in Jesus' name, amen. I love you guys. Take time to share this tonight. Take time to tell somebody that you care about them. Take time to worship God and when worry sets in, cast it off and worship God. It'll make the difference in your world. God bless you. I will see y'all later.